The Things That Only You Can Give from SAS Rogue Heroes The Authorized Wartime History by Ben McIntyre Navigating across the desert is not easy at any time. Crossing 70 miles of desert in the middle of the night, followed by 17 heavily armed jeeps with no headlights, an ancient map, and an increasingly impatient commanding officer, was the sort of task only a navigator who was either supremely gifted or mad would have considered undertaking. Where are we? demanded David Sterling, peering into the gloom. By my reckoning, we're less than a mile short of the field, said Mike Stadler. It's right in front of us. At that instant, the desert ahead exploded in a flood of artificial light. The landing strip lights had been switched on at Sidi Hanesh airstrip, 235 miles west-northwest of Cairo, on the Egyptian coast. A Luftwaffe night bomber was coming in to land. The date was the 26th of July, 1942. Sadler had brought them directly onto the target, on time, on the nose. That, Sadler said many years later, with thumping understatement, was a bit of a relief. At Sterling's signal, 18 jeeps rolled forward, each armed with four Vickers guns and enough firepower to destroy an entire air force, which was exactly what Sterling had in mind. A few days earlier, lolling under the truck and sucking on his pipe, Sterling had come up with a new plan and a change of tactics, a massed jeep attack. At the first battle of Alamein during July, Allied forces had stalled a second German advance into Egypt. The 8th Army had taken more than 13,000 casualties and the North African war was again reduced to stalemate. But Rommel's eastward thrust towards Alexandria and Cairo had been halted. According to air reconnaissance reports, Sidi Hanesh, or Fuka landing ground number 12, was the main German staging area for planes going to and from the front, principally Junker 52s, the transport aircraft on which Rommel was known to rely. L Detachment had been founded on concepts of stealth and economy, small groups of men achieving disproportionate results. The very success of these techniques now necessitated a noisier and blunter approach. Tales of the British commandos able to slip behind the lines and inflict devastating damage before flitting back into the desert had begun to spread on both sides of the front line. German radio, it was said, had even bestowed a nickname on the shadowy commander of this band of marauding rogues, the Phantom Major. The nickname was probably an invention of British propaganda, but it stuck. Sterling's activities certainly came to the attention of Rommel, who wrote in his diary, These commandos working from Kufra, an oasis near the Egyptian border, and the Qatara depression sometimes operated right up into Cyrenaica where they caused considerable havoc and seriously disquieted the Italians. British censorship 
and good sense, precluded reporting on SAS operations. But in the ranks of the 8th Army, stories of the unit's daring do became a staple of barroom chat and a most effective recruiting tool. The men of El Detachment were under orders never to brag of their achievements. They did not need to. Others boasted for them. In the words of Vladimir Penyakov, the adventurer known as Popsky, who led a separate detachment of desert raiders, Sterling swiftly emerged as the romantic figure of war in the Middle East, while his exploits part legend became a mainstay of British morale. The dramatic narrative of war is as important a weapon as guns and bullets, and at a time when the war in North Africa was going badly, Sterling and his men demonstrated a willingness and a capacity to fight back against the German advance. This sort of war possessed a definite flavour of romance, wrote Playdell. The men of El Detachment were mindful of their own drama, for they looked, dressed, and to some extent played the part of swashbuckling desert fighters. Some, thought Playdell, came in pursuit of glory to perform daring deeds which might become famous overnight. Regular irregulars, they carried a variety of guns. If a chappy likes a weapon, a Luger, Beretta, or just a forty-five, he carried that. Some adopted Arab headdresses or bandanas. Few wore regulation uniform. Almost all, including Sterling, sported bushy beards. At the most grinding, boring, colourless and perilous period of the Desert War, Sterling's raiders added a dash of exotic adventure, a reputation for indominate ability at a moment when Rommel threatened to dominate the battlefield. Few in the unit were conscious of it, but theirs was a psychological, even a theatrical role, as well as a military one. Sterling professed to be baffled by all the barroom nonsense being spoken about him and his unit. In truth, he reveled in the attention. But notoriety came with a price. The Axis forces had been bitten hard and were now taking countermeasures, erecting wire perimeter fences with lights, digging trenches around aerodromes, mounting additional guards, sometimes as many as one to each plane, and on some airfields stationing armoured cars at the gates with powerful floodlights. Since it was increasingly difficult to slip undetected onto an airfield, El Detachment would instead go in with all guns blazing. Twenty more jeeps arrived from Cairo, each one fitted with four Vickers machine guns, double mounted and bolted to the front and rear. With the new vehicles came additional supplies of water, rations, petrol, ammunition, explosives, spare parts, and a few welcome luxuries. Rum, tobacco, new pipes, sticky Turkish delight, and a pint of eau de cologne in place of soap. The men might be unable to wash, but they would go into battle highly perfumed. The peaceful desert hideout at Bir el Kusir was transformed into a busy transport hub, with jeeps swarming all over the escarpment. The place was beginning to look like Piccadilly, Playdell grumbled happily. The next night, 
a long line of vicious looking jeeps formed up for the full dress rehearsal. As if organising a Scottish reel, Stirling explained the plan. The jeeps, manned by both French and English troops, would form up abreast in two lines of seven with five yards between each vehicle, shooting outwards. Stirling would lead the way, firing forward, with two more jeeps flanking him a few yards behind in an arrow formation. 24 hours later, the double line of jeeps formed up again in the darkness. Sidihanesh airfield lay bathed in floodlight a few hundred yards ahead. Stirling fired a very light. The night turned green and then exploded. Lieutenant André Zornelt was a character straight out of French central casting. Intellectual, poetic, handsome, and unfeasibly brave. Before the war, he had been a professor of philosophy in Tunis. But with the fall of France, he immediately took up arms and volunteered as a paratrooper under Georges Berger. Of all the French recruits, none had adapted so completely to the SAS way of life. In an, in an article for a French magazine, Zornelt wrote, I need to complain about the war. Because of it, I have had to learn to live through anything. After the war, the problem will be to discover a similar peace. André Zornelt's team of three jeeps had been slowed by punctures, and when the morning mist lifted, they found themselves dangerously exposed in the open desert. A low ridge with a fringe of scrub offered at least a modicum of camouflage. Four Stukas discovered them at midday and swarmed down. Zernelt was hit in the shoulder and abdomen on the second pass. One of his comrades dragged him under cover. After nine attacks, the dive bombers had run out of ammunition and departed. The jeeps were riddled, but one was still functioning. Zernhelt was loaded aboard, conscious but fading, and they set off for the rendezvous in the hope of reaching Dr. Playdell in time. Zernhelt was too badly injured to withstand the jolting and after a few hours, the French team holed up in a small wadi. Soon after midnight, Zernelt turned to Francois Martin, his second in command, and said, I am going to leave you. Everything is in order with me. Moments later, he was dead. The 29-year-old philosopher was buried under a cross made from a packing case with the words, Aspirant André Zernhelt, Mort au Champ d'Honneur, 27th July, 1942. Going through his belongings back at the camp, Martin came across a notebook in which Zernhelt had written a poem. It has since become known as the Paratrooper's Prayer and was adopted as the official poem of the French Airborne Forces. I ask you, O Lord, to give me what I cannot obtain for myself. Give me, my Lord, what you have left. Give me what no one asks of you. I do not ask for repose, nor for tranquility of body and soul. I ask not for riches nor success, nor even health. My Lord, you are asked for such things so much that you cannot have any more of them. Give me, my God, what you have left. 
Give me what others don't want. I want uncertainty and doubt. I want torment and battle. And give them to me absolutely, O Lord, so that I can be sure of having them always. For I will not always have the courage to ask them from you. Give me, my God, what you have left. Give me what others do not want. But give me also the bravery and the strength and the faith. For these are the things, O Lord, that only you can give.